Our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 through 21. It is a long scripture, and so I'm going to actually intersperse it uh, in the sermon as we go through the sermon. But if you'd like to follow along and you have a Bible handy, feel free to look up Genesis 24, 1 through 21. If you don't have a Bible but you have a smartphone, you can also use that to do a Google search on Genesis 24, 1 through 21. Either way, we hope you'll follow along with us. And now, as we prepare to hear God's word, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our story this morning begins with the father of the Jewish faith, Father Abraham, and his desire to fulfill a promise that God made to him when he was younger, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sands of the sea. So we begin with verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Stop right there for a minute. All things but one. If you want for your descendants to be as numerous as the stars in the sky, you need descendants. You need children and grandchildren. And at this point in his life, and this is way advanced, and Abraham's life is nearing a close, he had two sons. One of his sons, Ishmael, is out of the picture completely. His one remaining son is Isaac, and Isaac is not married and doesn't have any children of his own. So that descendants as numerous as the stars piece is starting to look a little bit sketchy. And so, verse 2, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. This, by the way, is kind of like the pinky swear, or raise your right hand in swear in the ancient Middle East. Putting your hand underneath someone's thigh was just part of the way you make a vow. So, I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to my country and to my kindred and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back? To the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free of this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Now, it may seem to you from the opening lines of this story that the star of the show is Father Abraham, or possibly his son Isaac, upon whom all of his hopes rested. Or maybe it's the faithful servant who must now seek a wife for Isaac back in the old country among Abraham's people. But I don't think so. I think the real star or stars are about to be introduced in the very next verse. Verse 10. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed taking all kinds of choice gifts from his master. And he set out and went to Aram Naharaim, to the city of Nahor. So here we meet the real heroes, the real driving force behind our story, the ten camels. Yes, the camels. Why? I'm so glad you asked. Let me take a moment to talk about camels in the Middle East. 
We'll start off with the word camel itself. It's one of those rare words in English that comes to us directly from the Hebrew language. The word for camel in Hebrew was gamal. Sounds kind of like camel, right? That's because it is that word. When the ancient Greeks conquered all of the Middle East, they took that name for this strange animal from Hebrew and they took it into their own language as camelon. And then later the Romans came and they conquered the Middle East and Camelon became Camelus and that found its way eventually into English as our word camel. So today we still call this ancient animal the very same thing that Abraham would have called it all those thousands of years ago. But there's more. In ancient Hebrew and all of the Middle Eastern languages that are part of that family that came before even Hebrew, letters were originally pictograms, kind of like Egyptian hieroglyphics, where each picture represented a sound, but also an idea, a concept, a thing that was important to the culture. So the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and several related alphabets in the Middle East is Aleph, and it's a pictogram shaped like the head of an ox with horns. Oxen, or cattle, were the primary form of currency and food for in the ancient world, and so Aleph, the first letter, is one of the most important things. The second letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Beit, and Beit is a pictogram representing a house. The Hebrew word for house is Beit, as in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, house of bread. And so these first two letters, Aleph and Beit, are where we get our word alphabet. Aleph, Beit, alphabet. But the third letter in the ancient Hebrew alphabet and many Semitic languages is Gimel, or Camel. And the pictogram, as you might imagine, looks like the profile of a camel with front legs and hind legs and a tall head, neck stretching over up into a head. And that letter eventually morphs into the Roman and therefore modern English letters C, G, and K, which all make related sounds. K, G, K. And we use those letters a lot in our language. The letter K, if you think about it, even looks kind of like a camel. It looks like the letter Gimel with the two legs and the neck stretching up over into a head. So, if you use the letter C, the letter G, or the letter K, you can thank our furry friends, the camels. The first three letters of this ancient alphabet also represent the three most important things in the ancient world. Money or food, currency, shelter, and transportation. Even today, this is true. Money, houses, and cars are among the most important signs we have of status, security, prosperity in our own culture. All of this is to say just that camels are a pretty big deal in biblical times. The word camel shows up 65 times in the Bible, and most of those places where it's mentioned, it's part of a list showing a display or a catalog of wealth or power. In the book of Judges, when a foreign army threatens to invade Israel, they're described in this way. The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley as thick as locusts, and their camels were without number, countless as the sand on the seashore. And then there's this guy named Job, who is described by the Bible as the wealthiest man in all of the east. And Job had 3,000 camels. We'll talk more about Job and his camels next week. But basically, if you're poor in the Old Testament, you have a donkey. If you're middle class, you might have a cow or two. But if you are really someone, if you're someone important, someone special, you have a camel. And so Abraham, when he sends his servant back to his home country to find a wife for his son, sends that servant with no less than ten camels. 
Now, there is no practical need for 10 camels to carry back one servant, one bride, maybe another servant or two. This is a whole lot like pulling into a small town in a stretch limousine or a fleet of Ferraris. It's what you do if you want to be noticed, if you want to show off. Verse 11, he, this is the servant who has now reached Abraham's hometown, he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water. It was toward evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. I am standing here by the spring of water, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Now, I said earlier that the servant is not the hero of this story. That's the camels, of course. But the servant is still a pretty amazing guy. He just rode into town on ten camels. And no one knows that he's just a servant. He could have played that up. Why, yes, yes, I am kind of a big deal, me and my ten camels. He knows that he will get the attention of every eligible young woman in the town. And from there, it would simply be a matter to choose the best one, or the prettiest one, or the most elegantly dressed one, or maybe the one who comes riding up on a camel of her own. You see, Abraham didn't give him any particular instructions other than it has to be a woman from this town. Beyond that, Abraham doesn't seem to care much about what kind of woman his son Isaac marries. But the servant does care. And here, before he speaks a single word to anyone, he does two pretty amazing things. First, he commits the whole enterprise to God in prayer. And he does this out of love for Abraham and a desire to see Abraham's wish come true. Not just true, actually, but better than true. He wants the very best for Abraham and Abraham's son Isaac. And for this to be realized, he sees that he needs divine assistance. So he prays. The second amazing thing he does is establish one sole criteria to determine who he, whom he will choose. It's a criteria that is unconventional. It's not what we would expect given the times. It has nothing to do with beauty or wealth or power or family connections. Instead, his one criteria, the one thing he's looking for, is kindness and generosity. And not just kindness to him, because that would have been obvious. Of course you give a drink to the wealthy guy who comes in with ten camels. But he's looking for kindness to the animals, to the ten camels themselves. He says, in effect, Lord, the one who offers a drink, not just to me, but to each one of these ten camels. And camels drink a whole lot. That's a lot of water. That's going to take a lot of time. Camels are not also exactly pleasant to feed. And so the young woman who's kind enough to offer to do this service, she's the only one who will do for Abraham and his son Isaac. Verse 15. Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. Now, the servant doesn't know any of this. She comes from a good family line, but that's the narrator talking. The servant just sees someone coming. The girl was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. Again, he sees this, but he's already decided that that's not important. That's not his criteria. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered her jar 
upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again, and probably again and again and again, to the well to draw water. And she drew for all of his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Now, this is where our scripture portion today ends. But the story goes on beyond this for the rest of the chapter. I'm sure by now you can guess what the ending is. Rebecca, with the blessing of her family, goes home with the servant to become the bride of Isaac. And their children are Jacob and Esau. And Jacob's children become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel and the descendants of Rebekah and Isaac and thus also of Abraham become the people of Israel. And numbered among them are Moses, Elijah, King David, King Solomon, and in time Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Thank God for 10 camels a faithful servant, and one small act of kindness from a young girl. So what can we learn from this story today, especially as we count the camels or the valuable resources that have been entrusted to us in our own lives? I find three principles that I'd like to share with you. We'll start with Abraham. The camels, after all, were his resources, he didn't really need to send 10 camels to accomplish this task. That was a risk on his part. One or two would have accomplished the same result. And by sending 10 camels, he draws a lot of attention to himself or to his servant on the journey. They would have been a good target for raiders. Or the servant himself could have taken all 10 of the camels and all of those gifts and sold them somewhere and retired wealthy in some foreign country, never to see Abraham again. I'm sure Abraham was aware of these risks, and yet knowing the importance of the task, he still chose to send ten camels. So here's the first principle. Invest your camels most heavily, most generously, in the things that matter most. For Abraham, that meant his family, his future, and most of all, in God's promises. When God promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, it would have been really easy for Abraham to just sit back and say, okay, God, go for it. I'll wait right here, and we'll see what happens. But instead, Abraham springs into action. He becomes a partner with God to accomplish God's purposes for him. I believe that God has a purpose and a plan for each one of you. It may be different than the plan you have for yourself, but I suspect God's plan for you is probably a whole lot bigger than your plan. How will you partner with God to see that plan through? How will you invest your camels? Next, I want to confess consider the faithful servant. These were not his camels. They were a borrowed resource given to him for a purpose, not even his purpose, someone else's purpose. All of us, I think, have been from time to time entrusted with things that do not truly or permanently belong to us in our workplace, in our community. Even the act of raising children is kind of like this. Our children belong to us only for a season and for a sacred purpose. So the faithful servant then, I think, is a great example of what we are called to do with resources that are not our own. With great humility, seeking God first, with ingenuity and cre creativity, with genuine love for his master, he goes beyond what is expected of him. He brings back all ten camels and he brings back a bride beyond compare, beyond Abraham's expectations. So here's the second principle. 
when you deal with other people's camels, give back more than you were given. This will make people love you and respect you and want to deal with you. And it will make your Father in heaven proud of you too. Finally, let's consider the young girl, Rebecca. She had no idea who the camels belonged to, but she knew that they didn't belong to her. They weren't even a borrowed resource for her. They were just someone else's camels. But because of her generosity and kindness and thoughtfulness, all ten of those camels and all of Abraham's camels and Abraham's and Isaac's wealth would someday belong to her and to her children. So the third principle is my favorite one of all. If you want more camels, be nice. Be kind. Take care of the needs of others. And your Father in heaven will take care of your needs as well. To recap those three principles. First, invest your camels in the things that matter most. Second, when dealing with other people's camels, give back more than you were given. And third, be nice to the camels, to the people who bring them, and to the strangers in your midst. And people of First Presbyterian Church, may you be blessed with all the camels you can count, all the people you can share them with, all the days of your life. Let us pray. Lord, you have given us much. Sometimes it may not seem that way, but you have given us every breath that we draw, every moment that we share with another person. You have given us everything that we are and everything that we know. Help us to use those resources that you have given us wisely, but help them most of all, help us use them for the benefit of others in our world, in our communities, in our lives. Give us the wisdom, the strength of purpose to share what we have been given, to realize and be thankful for what we have been given, but to use those things to do good in our world. We pray all of these things just as you have taught us to pray, together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.